Hello, everyone, and welcome again to another uh, topic in um, the series, God is Really Good. Um, this is uh, a social media platform that we call Let's Talk About God. And that's exactly what we do on this platform. We talk about God. And um, today's topic is topic number seven in the 10 series um, or 10 topic series, as I said, entitled God is Really Good. And today's title or, or topic is How uh, Does God Smite? Um, I think that that's a very important uh, topic. I think that we've heard different um, interpretations, different understandings of how God smites in the Bible. And today we want to look at a few Bible verses that will help us to uh, hopefully understand that a bit uh, better and challenge maybe even our previous views we've had on that or our understandings in that matter. And uh, also it could be to remind us of uh, God's uh, God's love for us and how he uh, doesn't want to destroy us. Um, also, let me take this opportunity to, to welcome uh, James, my uh, co-presenter in this series. How are you, James? Oh, good. Uh, Thank you, my brother. <laughs> yeah, it's good to hear you. As always, it's great to be alongside James as we share about the character of God and um, obviously his, uh, his love for us. And also, this will probably highlight a little bit of how God has been misrepresented as well uh, by his by his children in the sense that we have believed and understood certain things about him or his character that are not true. So um, I just want to um, I just want to uh, share a little bit about that. And as we always say, um, feel free to contact us at let's talk about God three at gmail.com. We're always happy to hear from you. We'd love to answer any questions if we can, because <laughs> we, we're not uh, uh, a know-it-all. But uh, if we can, we're happy. We're also happy to, as I say all the time, learn from you. If you have some comments that you'd like to share, we're happy to hear from you and uh, so that we can continue to grow and, uh, and understand about God and uh, his character as well. So anyway, as I said, um, in today's topic, we are dealing with the word smite or smiting, uh, mostly used in and throughout the Old Testament. Um, uh, uh, and sometimes through the Old Testament, it is understood in, I guess, in a variety of different ways. I guess some um, understandings of the word uh, smite is like God inflicting sickness and disease or um, he uh, to suffer some negative uh, event to take place. And I guess you could look at some of that in Deuteronomy chapter 28, verses 22, 27, 28, and 35. Um, and, and since the Bible uses uh, the word smite in, in, in different uh, um, variations um, that mean, I guess, God's punishment, um, Today, we, I would like to really look at what that word means biblically, not traditionally, not um, by my interpretation and understanding, but what does the Bible say in regards to how God smites? And before we enter in upon that topic, James, would you uh, lead us in prayer, please? Yes, yes. Thank you. Let's pray. Our loving Father, thank you for the beautiful day you gave to us. And so also thank you for the opportunity we have today through your grace to come together with my brother Sean and to um, to talk about how does God is might. Mm. Because there's uh, so many, so many people might uh, misunderstand uh, how you smite. Because even us, before when we smite someone, for our children and in, in our own way. There is, a, there is a reason for us to do something, but uh, they will see themselves in the scripture what is the reason for you to smite and what that means when you smite what you do. Did you do the same thing like we do to our children or your smite is different? 
And we will glad we will be so glad to read the scripture and understand the scripture and be ready for your great return. Thank you so much, Lord, for everything you have done for us in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you, thee. Amen. 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 Thank you, James, for uh, leading us in the prayer. It's always good to start off with prayer because we know Amen. the Bible is of no part, no private interpretation. We mm. need the Holy Spirit to be with us. And it's good uh, to ask God to join us in these conversations. So, look, I want to jump straight into it. Uh, again, our topic is topic number seven, which is how does God smite? And what I've done is I've got just three Bible references with, you know, some explanations in there uh, about the use of the word smite and how it applies um, to God. So I want to jump right into it. So my first Bible example comes from 1 Kings chapter 14, verses 15 and 16. And that reads, for the Lord shall smite Israel as a reed is shaken in the water, and he shall root up Israel out of his good land, which he gave to their fathers, and shall scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their grooves or groves, providing, provoking the Lord to anger. And he shall give Israel up. Those are key words there. He shall give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam who did sin and who made Israel to sin. Now, as we look at that, uh, that, that Bible verse, as I said, there's some key words in there that I think sometimes are overlooked um, or misunderstood. And, and the key words is he shall give Israel up. So um, um, under the reign of um, King Jeroboam, um, who, um, I don't want to say made as in force, but made as in his rulership, um, Jerusalem um, to worship, uh, or he promoted the worship of uh, a golden calf, which obviously we know is adultery. Uh, and because of that, that uh, worship spread throughout uh, Jerusalem and Jerusalem um, was made to sin. And obviously that made God a little bit upset. And um, he speaks in the language of smiting Israel because of their um, pagan or idol worship. Um, um, it is um, it is not like what, what I'm trying to say. It's not only like a, a lack of faithfulness um, to the covenant that hurts God, but it's also the destructive consequences that adultery has on the adulterers themselves. Um, even we read in Genesis 6 and like, uh, I think it's verse 17, when God says he will destroy mankind in a flood and things like that. But it also talks about how God was grieved. God was sorrowful and he was sorrowful for the consequences of the sin that um, were fallen upon the people, uh, his creatures, his his children, um, as we say. And, and the same here, he's, he, he He's, he, it's not only just the the unfaithfulness to the covenant that they have established, but it also is the destructive consequences that it brings upon his children because of their adultery worship. And also um, it affects those around them. Um, and also it brings great grief and pain. So so those are some of the things that, um, that go with um, us. Um, worshiping uh, idols and pagans but the word itself uh, smite um what can I say generally or 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 usually especially in the old testament has violent connotations itself and uh gives us a picture of a very angry god uh that is sitting on his throne waiting to destroy sinners and uh how this angry god is prepared to strike its subjects uh, with his wrath. You know, that's what we get, you know, of, of our God. That's the picture that is in most minds. And that's why many people are fearful of God and why many people don't want to worship a God who is like that. Um, and I don't blame them. Um, but so this is how we mostly picture God, uh, especially as they say, the God of the Old Testament, 
which I found a little bit funny because the God of the Old Testament is the God of the same of the of the New Testament, which is Jesus Christ. And he says that quite clearly. Um, the rock that they uh, I think Paul says in Hebrews, the rock that they drank from was Christ, you know, and um, in the olden times. And then also um, uh, it talks about uh, in Colossians one talks about God. Uh, Jesus was the creator of everything. And stuff like that and john one says jesus um was um was the word that was was made uh a uh, uh, flesh and he dwelt with god you know from the beginning so um anyway i don't want to ramble on about that sometimes i get myself in a little bit of a rut and uh by rambling on so let me move on and um so when we see god with these uh this uh violent connotations waiting to uh, destroy the sinners, um, then that affects our relationship. And, and God wants to have an intimate relationship with us. So that's why today this topic is how does God smite? Because I think that word has been misunderstood. And I think also it brings, as I said earlier, uh, views of, uh, of violence and, and, and great wrath um, from a loving God who I think has been misunderstood because of this word, or there's many others, but this is the word we're discussing today. So anyway, um, can I suggest, uh, it's always a suggestion from James and I, because we cannot tell anyone what to do, but we also, you know, want you to, to read the, the scriptures that we do share and study for yourself and then reach out to us if you have any comments or, or anything that you would like to share. Um, at let's talk about God three at gmail.com. But yeah, I just want to suggest that God smites by giving people up to their sins. And look, I believe, because the Bible says it, that every sin contains within itself its own seeds of destruction. Obviously, we read in Romans 6 23, the wages of sin is death, and then we can read in uh, James 1, uh, 13 through 15. We've referenced these so many times. And um, uh, particularly verse 15, where it says, when, uh, when lust is conceived, it bringeth forth sin. And when sin is conceived, it bringeth forth death. So that's an easy mathematical equation that you definitely want to avoid. Um, James, is there anything you want to say so far from anything that I've said uh, up until now? I'm just taking um, your... Um your first chapter uh first king chapter 14 verses 15 to 16 yeah and uh in your own verses there said um said uh they provoking the lord to anger and um there's a reason for god is might them as you just said when god is might it just gives them away gives them up right and the reason god gives them up because in this verse it said itself, because they have made their groves and provoking the Lord to anger. Mm -hmm. Because they, they follow Zeroboam, Zeroboam and, uh, and also sin is separate you from God. Yeah. Because Zeroboam sin, they follow Zeroboam, they participate with him, and that's the reason they separate themselves from God. And when God said he smite, as you just mentioned, he hide his face or he just uh, remove his protection from them. And that how he smite people. Yes, it's very clear and simple, isn't it? And, yeah. also, be, uh, and also, if you check this word, because you're going to many chapters and many verses, especially like uh, before Deuteronomy chapter 15, verse 10, Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 12. First King chapter 14, verse 16. There is more than that. But um, that's how you see uh, many places, they did the same similar thing to God. And God have, there is a certain times God have to let them go because that is their freedom of choice. Yeah. Hmm. God, God respects our free will. Exactly, my brother. Yeah. As James just said, like, uh, uh, when God gives uh, people up. That's when he removes from them the protection that would normally keep them from the evil forces that tend them harm. And that was a key word in First Kings uh, 14, 15, verses 15 through 16, where it says, 
he shall give Israel up. And I'm going to give some scripture verses as we get into this about how uh, when he gives people, uh, gives Israel up is the hiding of his face, which is the loss of his protection. I'm going to quote some verses in just a little while, but just bear with me for a second as we as we discuss this uh, word smite and the loss of God's protection um, from forces that um, want to have uh, evil consequences on his people. But but also God then allows those people who have rejected him, which is we just talked about and said the free will choice to suffer the consequences of their sin. You see, um, and in Second Chronicles, we are told that um, that God would smite Israel. Um, and, and look, we're just touching on it now. We're going to get into it a bit more. But I, I want to really see what the Bible says about how God smites. And wait a minute, I'm feeling a little itch in my arm. Anyway, and in order for us to continue down that path to clearly understand how God smites. I want us to look at uh, Second Chronicles chapter 13, verses 15 and 16. So in Second Chronicles, we find where it says, then the men of Judah gave a shout. And as the men of Judah shouted, it came to pass that God smote Jeroboam and all Israel before Abijah and Judah. And the children of Israel fled before Judah and God, here's these words again, and God delivered them into the hand, into their hands, delivered up, uh, gives his people or allows his people to be attacked by forces that he would normally um, uh, protect them from. And in that, in that, um, in that verse, Second Chronicles uh, chapter 13, we see that God again then delivered them. And therefore, I, I have concluded that God smiting is not direct. It is not direct. It is a delivering up of sinners to the very evil forces that they themselves have chosen. So um, through J Jerusalem, through uh, their king, Jeroboam, have, have uh, created the, the golden calf uh, for idolatry worship. And if they want, and God is saying that if you continue to reject and refuse me and you want to worship a creature, then I have to let you do that. But with that, as you said, sin separates us from God. There's a separation between us. And the Bible describes that separation as the hiding of God's face uh, at that time. So uh, God has uh, allowed them to, uh, to, uh, to suffer the consequences from the forces of evil that uh, they themselves have chose. And so God smites not personally, using omnipotent or, or I would say like divine power to bring harm, but by giving up or delivering up Israel to the consequences of their rebellion. And we read in Galatians chapter six, I think it's verses seven through nine, where God says that you reap what you sow. Mm -hmm. um, so it is just God allowing them to sow of the, of the choices, to reap of the choices that they have made. Even us as parents, our children become a certain age and we allow them to see the results of their choices. And sometimes it does bring a little bit of pain. And uh, sometimes by choosing the wrong thing um, can also be fatal. And like I'll give a small example is, you know, in Australia, uh, there is a heavy uh, drinking culture and it does start very young. And, you know, we counsel our children like, hey, do not drink and drive. Actually, I counsel my children to not drink at all. <laughs> to be quite honest, but to not drink and drive. And there's all type of signs and things up about drinking and driving and, you know, what the law says against it. But if someone drinks and drives, they made a poor choice. And then if they get in an accident, then that accident is not something that God brought about. It is the, it is the action of their choices that they have made. And because the alcohol has impaired them and their vision and their reaction time, and their, men, their mental makeup, then that is what has come. So the same with God. God is not out there deliberately smiting or bringing his wrath upon people and individually looking down with a, 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 a scowl on his face to, to smite or to 
bring his wrath upon his children. It is our choices. And the same with Jerusalem under Jeroboam. God has allowed their, them to reap what they sow. Um, so, so, so now um, um, I want to look at another Bible verse. Uh, still on, still on smiting. The whole topic is on how does God smite. But this next Bible verse is found in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter seven, verses eight and nine. And I'd like to read those to you. And it reads, "Now will I, sh yeah, now will I shortly pour out my fury." upon thee and accomplish mine anger upon thee and i will judge or execute judgment i will judge thee according to thy ways and will recompense key word again recompense thee for all thine abominations and my eye shall not spare neither will i have pity i will again it says i will recompense second time you hear that be according to thy ways, to thy ways and thine abominations that are in the midst of thee. And ye shall know that I am the Lord that smiteth. Okay. Now we have to look at that word recompense. And when I looked at that word, um, it's no secret. I've shared on this platform before I'd use a study tool called eSword. It's not related to any denomination or institution. It's something that I think Rick Myers has put together, made available for everyone to have access to. It's very free. And um, I use it a lot. It has the Greek and the Hebrew, and it has various different commentaries, but I mostly use the Greek and the Hebrew and the Bible itself, because the Bible is his, ver his, his, his very own uh, interpreter. But other resources are available. The, and looking at the Hebrew of that word recompense, it means to permit and allow or give someone over to or deliver up something. Uh, this comes from the Hebrew word pronounced Nathan, 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 Nathan. And it is the same word that is used in 1 Kings uh, chapter 14 and verse 16 that I started off this uh, uh, topic with. And that same word, is used when we, in verse 16, when we read, he shall give Israel up. That is Nathan. That means he shall permit or allow or give someone over or deliver someone to, or delivers up something. So God allows it. God smites by allowing us to suffer the consequences of our own choices. And um, I, I, uh, James, do you want to say anything? I, I got some other things to say before I go to this. Yeah, yeah. When you look at uh, when you look at God Himself, uh, when the people of Israel was in Egypt, and uh, God delivers them out of Egypt, there is no one need to get hurt, and uh, God love all His children. Egyptian is God children, yeah, and Zeroboam is God children, and uh, God, but He's a bad one. But uh, actually, we are all bad, but, you know, but when we learn about God, we come closer to God, we respect him, and uh, we follow his word. But Jeroboam is another bad children, but what did happen? Jeroboam, his army, how about, he got about 800,000 army, 800,000 people uh, follow him and follow this golden calf as well. And they, when they heard about David become king, they want to attack David uh, straight away. Oh, and oh. what David do? David, uh, David, um, he, he inquired, inquired of God. He, he, he talked to God. He asking God, God, do, 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 is they want to attacking me? Uh, would you be with, with us? And do you think if I go, I will win this war? And God now said, yes, David, you go and, 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 and you will win this war. And but what he did with his, other, with his son, Zeroboam, he have to, because you don't want me, you want golden calf, I, my protection is removed from you. And that means, as shown my brother just mentioned, he gave him up. Mm -hmm. And when he gave him up and David go, and they have to run away in front of David. Because soon when God gives you up, even me, even anybody, you will feel you don't have this protection. You're not 
you feel like um, you miss something mm. inside of you. You are afraid, you know, but that's what God did. God have to give you up. And um, but God not give any of his children up as even if they are bad, but when they when they're forcing God to go, and God have to respect that and go. And they preferred gold and calf instead of God. But that's what did happen. God gives them up. Yeah. Amen. Um, so so from that, so far, I think that we are on track to say that that God only smite God smites not by actively bringing about the destruction to a nation, but by removing his protection and allowing people to have the very thing that they want, despite the fact that it could lead to their demise. I think that's very fair so far. And I hope that our, our, our viewers uh, would, uh, would, would be on, on, on the same page with us so far moving forward. Also, I think it's important that we remember that that word for recompense, as I said, is the Hebrew word Nathan, which is the same word that is used in uh, um, 1 Kings 14, verse 16, when God says that he will give them up. So we got to follow what it means. And the, obviously the, the words prior to that says that God will smite. Then it says how he will smite by giving them up. So, so now we're going to move to our, my example number two. Now example number two is found in Isaiah chapter 57, verse 17. And this is more in line with what James was saying about the loss of God's protection is the hiding of his face. And, and I want to just share a little bit about that. So in Isaiah chapter 57 and verse 17, I read it from the expanded Bible, but it reads, God told Isaiah, for the iniquity of his covetousness was I wroth and smote him. Then it says, I hid me and was wroth and he went on forwardly in the way of his heart. All right, so it talks about smoting and it, and God talks about hiding. It hid me and it talks about God's wrath, which is, he says, I was wroth, his wrath as well. Um, so God was angry because uh, the, the people were being dishonest in order to make money, if you read in that chapter and stuff like that. And it, it, some, some versions of translations say because of their sinful greed. And then... Um, is it, he uh, God says that I will punish them, and uh, he turned away from them, uh, which is a hiding of his face in anger, which is God's wrath. Um, but they continue to do evil, and it says that they turned away in their hearts. Uh, they turned away in their hearts. In other words, they rejected God's counsel. Uh, they didn't want to. Um, Listen to God. And we know from Jeremiah chapter 17 and 9 that we know our hearts are deceitfully wicked. It says who can trust it, but it says it turned they turned away in their hearts. Now, further evidence for uh, God's hiding his face, which is the loss of his protection, can be found in Deuteronomy chapter 31, verses 16 and 18, Deuteronomy chapter 32 and verse 20, and also Ezekiel chapter 39, uh, verse 23. Uh, if you can read those for your own proof of evidence and for your own study, it will be it will prove beneficial uh, to you. So we've shared those with you today. Um, also, um, so back to the original question is how uh, is God said to smite Israel? You know, or how is God? How does God smite? But in reference to the Bible verses we are discussing today, how does God smite Israel? And the Bible continually tells us by giving them up, by forsaking, by abandoning, by letting their enemies have their way with them because of their continual rejection of God. You know, um, so and as I um, related or, or shared earlier, is that we reap what we sow from Galatians chapter six. Mm -hmm. um, so. Can I continue to say that God does not smite? I might sound like a broken record, but I just want to make sure the point is coming across crystal clear. God does not smite by personally harming anyone. He's only said to smite 
when his protection is no longer present and he has permitted, permitted his people to suffer the consequences of their sin. Now, if you still believe that God personally smites by destroying, then my final verse should be a very real eye opener for you on how God smites. Before we get to my, my third and final verse, I want to ask James, do you have, want to share anything about um, uh, Isaiah chapter 57 and 17 or any other verse that we've uh, uh, listed? Or In, in, this, in this verse also, uh, you can see they refuse to change. And God uh, gives them instruction, gives them knowledge, but they refuse to listen. They refuse to change and God have to give them up. And, um, and not only, there's so many places I can uh, mention it in the Bible, and also even in the future, in a New Testament, like uh, Revelation chapter 9 and Revelation chapter 16, uh, there's many verses there. They, in, the, in the future, even now, people will refuse to accept God, refuse to change. They prefer to live the way they are. But uh, when, when that happens, God has to hide himself or to let them go. That is very sad, but that's the way it is. But that's the reason you and I and other people try to explain to them, God very sad to give you up. But uh, if you're forcing him, uh, there is no way for him to keep on uh, holding you because otherwise the devil said, where is the freedom of choice? Yeah. You said you give them, you make them, you give them freedom of choice, and then you hold all to them, and it's not good. L leave them, they are mine now, and God have that to was, accept that. That was exactly what he said about Job. He says, of course yes. Job love you. You put a hedge around him, you protect him. Yeah. If you, exactly. if you take that hedge away, he will curse you to your face. Yes. You know, and God has to have it a level playing field. He has exactly. to give Satan access to us too. If we reject him and we decide we want to follow Satan, then he has to give us up to that which we desire mm. and whatever consequences that come with that. Um, yeah, that's a great point to, to mention. And there was something else that came to my mind when you were sharing that about, um, about oh, the accuser. So in my conclusion, I'm going to share a little bit about Zechariah chapter 3, about Satan who goes to God and accuses us before God and asks for the right to destroy us because we are his, like James said. So just stay tuned for that. That'll come in the conclusion. But right now, it's my third and final verse on um, the, the topic, how does God smite? And the third and final verse is found in Exodus chapter 12 and verse 23. Now, this is a very hotly contested topic in the sense that so many people see God as the destroying agent of the firstborn in Egypt, whereas myself and James, we don't see it that way. We don't understand it that way. We see it clearly as Satan was the destroying agent in the destruction of the firstborn in Egypt. And look, I've got a little bit of uh, evidence that I'd like to share with you, but obviously, as we always say, please study the Bible for yourself mm -hmm. and see what it says to you because the spirit of God is talking to you individually. And there are some things that, look, we don't understand right away either, but we continue to walk that path with God and God will reveal and make known to us the truth about who he is. So don't get discouraged and please don't get confused, but continue to walk and trust God. Amen. Amen. So yeah, so that last verse is found in Exodus chapter uh, 12 and verse 23. And you can read verse 12 as well before that, if you like, but I'm going to just say verse uh, 23 in Exodus 12. And um, but and obviously everything that we are sharing, read the entire verses, read the context so that you understand. It's very easy for someone to pick a particular verse and given a, a particular interpretation of it and say that's what God's doing. But we need the whole Bible, all 66 books before we can come to a conclusion of who God is. So I just pray that you will study it and see for yourself. Be like the Bereans. We always use them as an example. Go and study. Paul came and spoke to them and, and taught them marvelous things about God. But they went and studied and it came back and said, yes, what you're saying is true. And we are the same. We would like for you to study these things and then come back to us 
reach out to us on let's talk about God three at gmail.com. We'd love to hear from you. Exodus chapter 12, verse 23 reads, the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he seeth the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over, keyword, mm -hmm. pass over the door and will not suffer. That word suffer is an old English word that just means permit. He will not permit. It will not permit or will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. Okay, okay, now we're in the deep end. So the, the key to understanding the, this truth uh, is to, uh, about how God smite, is to understand the word Passover uh, as it's used in this Bible verse or this passage. Um, this um, um, word has been misunderstood, misapplied, and um, it has been shared um, amongst uh, Christianity as God is the one who is the active agent. Um, but I just want to say to you that I hope today that this, uh, this will be clarified and will give us and in you a, um, a, a new understanding of the meaning of how God smites. Okay. Um, some believe that the word Passover means that God will personally kill the Egyptians uh, or the Egyptian firstborn, but skip over or walk by the Israelite homes. That's that's a common interpretation. That's a common understanding of uh, that word Passover. And, but I'm here to say I want to challenge that understanding today by saying I don't believe or we don't believe that this can be true of the word Passover. And we can't just make that claim without having any evidence. And that is because it is the same word used in Isaiah 31, in which God promises to come down and fight for his people. In Isaiah 31, it says, I'll read the verse in a second. It says, he will hover over his people like a bird to protect them. Now, uh, that is important. Um, so what I'm going to do is it is found in Isaiah chapter 31, verses four and five. I'm going to jump straight to the main verse, which is verse five, if that's OK. Obviously, with everything that we supply, read the context, read the entire chapter, read the chapters before and the chapters after to get clarity and understanding. And obviously, seek God in prayer before you enter to the reading or the studying of his word. Amen. 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 And uh, verse five says. As birds flying, so will the Lord of hosts defend Jerusalem. Defending also, he will deliver it, and passing over, he will preserve it. Again, that is Isaiah chapter 31 and verse 5. Now, um, I think the key to understanding this is to know the Hebrew of that word, Passover. The Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach, and it's spelled a couple of ways, P-A-S-O-A-C-H or P-A-S-A-C-H, Pesach, okay? And in Esau, there is a study tool called the Treasury of Scriptural Knowledge, T-S-K, T-S-K T -S -K as shortened, and I, I read that on this particular verse, and it says this about Isaiah chapter um, 31 and verse five, it says, as a mother bird spreads her wings to cover her young, throws herself before them and opposes the rapacious bird. Rapacious is a, a, an aggressive bird. Um, it's, you know, obviously seeking to do harm to uh, the baby birds. And, um, the, the 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 rapacious bird that assaults them so shall Je jehovah protect as with a shield jerusalem from the enemy protecting and delivering listen to this springing forward and rescuing her so the hebrew definition for the word passover pasach is leaping forward 
I hope somebody out there is saying amen. Because the, 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 the pieces of the puzzle are starting to fall in place. Um, the penny has dropped. The Hebrew word for Passover is Pesach, meaning leaping forward. So let me read Isaiah 31, verse 5 in a different translation. This comes from the voice translation. And it reads, um, as birds hover protectively over their nests, so the eternal commander of heavenly armies will guard Jerusalem from all harm. Not only that, but God will protect and save it, rescue it, and keep it. Amen. Those are Amen. some words from a mighty God who's not seeking to destroy, but to protect those who have chosen his way of salvation, which is the blood of the lamb over the lentils or the doorpost. And for us today, obviously, the way of salvation is accepting Jesus Christ, his blood, which is his life that he offered as a sacrifice for us. They done it by faith back then because Jesus had not been born. They trusted God. And even ours today is done by faith because we trust God. Amen. So I hope that that, that is starting to um, swirl in your mind and, and give a different understanding, a different view of how God smites. And I, I want to continue, and then I'm going to uh, open it up for James uh, for any comments that he may have uh, in, in regards to these uh, Bible verses in Exodus 12, 23 and Isaiah 31, verse 5. But I want to say, so, so, so now God's passing over the Israelite homes should be understood, understood that it does not mean that he merely avoided them. But rather, he was leaping in front. Oh, man, I can just vision this. I can just vision this with my imagination. God protecting his children. He was leaping in front of each home that had the blood. Leaping in front. Or, as in Jeremiah 31, 5, he was hovering over it in order to protect it from the coming plague. What a mighty God we serve. What Amen. a mighty God we serve. He's Amen. not seeking to harm or destroy any of his children. Mm -hmm. He is desiring to protect us and to reveal the truth about his character that we may make our choice as Joshua did in Joshua 24, 15. With this day, me and my house will serve the Lord. Now, the choice is yours. Amen. Amen. And um, so... Um, the, now I just want to say this, the word for Passover that is known in uh, the institutionals or denominational uh, circles um, as it is taught has been misunderstood. It is a reference, the word uh, Passover, it is a reference to God's protection from death rather than a promise not to bring death. And I hope you heard that. That is a very important point. Let me read it again. It is God, the word Passover, or the true definition of the word Passover is, it is a reference to God's protection from death rather than a promise not to bring death. God smites by not protecting the house that did not have the blood of the lamb on it. The house of the Egyptians, he gave over. He permitted, he allowed, he suffered. The murderous forces, or he gave he gave them over, sorry, to the murderous forces around them. Um, now, um, also in Psalm 78, helps us to understand this as well. Psalm 78, verses 49 and 51. And I'm going to read that to you. And it's talking specifically, David is talking specifically, the psalmist is talking specifically about this situation of the firstborn, the destruction of the firstborn in Egypt or the death of the firstborn in Egypt. And it reads, this is Psalm 78 verses 49 and 50, it reads this. He cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by sending, that word for sending in the Hebrew is mishlakath. I'm not very good with Hebrew pronunciations as you can hear, but the, 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 by sending, that word for sending, mish, lak, ah, 
means to release. That means that it should say that he cast upon them the fierceness of his anger, wrath and indignation and trouble by releasing evil angels among them. He made a way to his anger. He spared not their soul from death, but here's this word again, but gave their life over to the pestilence and smote. There you go. How is God smiting? By giving their life over. He smote all the firstborn in Egypt, the chief of their strength in the tabernacle of Ham. So this last thing I want to say here is that God smote the Egyptians, before I start my conclusion, God smote the Egyptians when he gave their life over to pestilence. This is expressing, uh, this is uh, an expression of God's permission and not causation. Mm -hmm. Do you understand that God permitted that and he allowed that because they refused him? And what did, what did Pharaoh say um, um, uh, about God when Moses came? What did he say? He said, who is God that I should obey? Mm. So his arrogance, his pride, and the worship of false gods brought about the destruction of the firstborn when God released the forces that were opposed against them anyway. God was holding them back. We should be thanking God every day that we are alive because there are forces posed against us, whether we see them or not. We read about them in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. Go read it. There are forces posed against us. There's a war going on. And just because you, doesn't, you don't see it don't mean it's not happening. Believe me, it's happening. And if you don't see it, it's because your head's in the sand. Because there's enough evidence around us as proof of this war going on. And I'm not talking about physical wars between mankind where the enemy of the adversary is using man to, to bring about his results or showing exactly how he would rule the world if he was in control. But there's a war going on for your soul. And how you understand the character of God and who he is may impact your salvation and the choices you make. Mm -hmm. Amen. So, so just want to say this, and then James, is a, it, it, it's on to you. But God smote the Egyptians when he gave their life over to the to the pestilence. This was an expression of permission, not causation. God brought disease on Egypt by permitting satanic evil angels to have their way. In Hebrew chapter one, verse 14, it says that God's angels are ministering spirits. It doesn't allude to them as, destruct as destructive agents. And we have many Bible verses on that. If you want some Bible verses on that, please write to us at let's talk about God three at gmail.com. And we will be happy to share those with you. James, anything you want to say? I've said a mouthful, but I want to, I'd like to hear from you if you have anything before we go into our conclusion. Yes, um, I'm very glad in your talk, you use uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 23. But Exodus chapter, chapter 12, verse 23, that is one pers perspective, Yes. right? Yes. We have another perspective in chapter 12, verse 12. And yes. when, when I take the first one, uh, Exodus chapter 12, verse 12, I explained that to my friend, to other people as well. They said, you see, God himself who destroy, who kill the firstborn in Egypt in verse 12. And I said to them, if God really did it in first per perspective, that means God not needs the destroyer to do the to do the job if he's already do the job in verse 12 why in verse 23 he, he not allowed uh you know he not allowed uh the destroyer to destroy them if he's already done it it not make sense you see but he he, he makes sense to, to show us he he, he, uh, he not let him come yeah, he didn't do it himself in verse in verse twelve, but in verse twenty three, he allowed him to destroy them because uh, because of the of their sin. Now there is another another place is very important. Sean, I didn't hear you mention that where God is might 
uh, the shepherd in the Old Testament in, uh, in uh, Isaiah 53 verse 4. Yeah. You know, but uh, Isaiah 53 verse 4, he said, we did esteem him, he striken, he smitten of God and afflicted. That's what we think. That's what we esteem uh, him to do. But when we look at Jesus Christ on uh, in the New Testament, Mark chapter 14, verse 27 and 28, mm. Jesus Christ tells this uh, prophecy of uh, uh, Isaiah 54, 53, verse 4. And then in in um, in uh, chapter in Mark chapter 15, verse 34, when he was on the cross, he said, Father, why you forsaken me? Why you give me up? He didn't. He didn't say, "Why are you hitting me? Why are you? Why are you killing me?" No. Why are you abandon me? And also, this death on the cross. Everybody should understand that if we refused, even until the end, to accept Jesus Christ, that kind of death we will die. What death separation from God? Separation from God, and that what we call we will never come back. But uh, Jesus Christ did come back because there is no sin in him. That is an example for us to know, don't go this way. Because yeah. I am the source of life, Jesus said. You know, and God the Father said, I am the source of life. If you abandon me, I am the vine, you are the branch. If you cut yourself off, you will die. Yeah. You know, and there's so many verses and chapters, you know. <laughs> James, uh, thank you for highlighting that. That is a powerful verse about God striking or smiting Jesus, as it says in Isaiah 53, verse 4. It's mm. powerful. And we know that God did not strike Jesus. Mm. We know that Jesus yelled out, my God, my God, why has thou forsaken me? That separation that he felt. Uh, thank you for sharing. That was a powerful uh, explanation point about how God smites. Um, I'll go into my conclusion now because I'm we always worry of time, and I'm I'm fast approaching the, you have the an hour. hour seven minutes. <laughs> yeah, the hour, the hour, uh, an hour for this uh, this topic. So let me try to push through this very very quickly, um, but not in such a way that I rush and overlook or or skip through some stuff that is very important. So I do uh, call for your your patience, and I do want to thank you in advance for your understanding um, in the matter. But uh, in my conclusion, I just want to say that. God's method of smiting is not directly to hurt or destroy anyone. Mm. Amen. Um, he has no desire to do that. None. He sent his son to die for us to show his love so that we can see who he is. Jesus said to, to Philip, if you see me, you've seen the father. Mm. Jesus, John 17 says that is eternal life, that you know him, the one and only true God. And is and is the one he sent, Jesus Christ. And so God doesn't desire to destroy anybody. But God wants us deeply or very much to turn from our rebellious life. And we can read that in, in Exodus, I mean in uh, Ezekiel 30, 18, chapter 18 and verse 32, and 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 9. However, if we are unwilling to do so, to turn from our rebellious life, he allows us to reap what we sow. Mm. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 28, there's another powerful verse in mention of the Passover. And it reads, Hebrews 11, verse 28 reads, through faith, through trust. That is a Greek word for faith that is pistis. It means trust confidence, belief, okay? Trust through faith, through trust, he kept the Passover and the sprinkling of blood, least he that destroyed the firstborn should touch them. Hmm. God didn't destroy the firstborn in Egypt. No. A separation there between the destroyer and the savior. He that destroyed he didn't say that I destroyed. He said, he that destroyed. John 10, 10. John 10, 10. That's on, <laughs> that's on, my, that's on my final, that's on my final 
uh, final uh, verse I, I'd like to mention, but I'm happy to say now John 10, 10 talks about the separation, who is the destroyer and who came to give eternal life. And so also if we compare Hebrews 11 and 28 with 1 John chapter 5 and verse 18, which reads, but he who has been born of God keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Amen. Amen. It is the wicked one, which is Satan, who touches people in a way to do them harm. God, on the other hand, is our protector. Amen. Is our protector. Uh, Dwight J. Pentecost, what a last name. Dwight J. Pentecost, um, in his comics, in his book, Faith That Endures, uh, the, uh, the book of Hebrews applied to the real issues of life. On page 201, he says this of the word Passover. The word translated Passover in that text literally means to hover over. So he's going to he's going to reference also Isaiah chapter 31, verse five. The, 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 the literal word uh, 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 translated for Passover means to hover over the picture. Picture this in your mind. Use your imagination. The picture is that when the Lord saw the blood, he would position himself over the doorpost to protect all those who had sought refuge through the blood by faith, by trusting God. And he would turn, the Lord would turn aside the destroyer who had come to execute judgment. Mm -hmm. Powerful, powerful statement. So instead of the destroyer working alongside God as an agent of destruction, it seems that God is merely allowing him free access to the Egyptians due to Pharaoh's rejection of God. As I said earlier, Pharaoh's word was to Moses, who is God that I should obey him? But on the other hand, God opposes this destroyer to protect Israel as he does for the, his children today. God protects us from the enemy. Mm -hmm. We should be very thankful to God. All his children he protects. Especially, not, not especially, but his children, I should say his children who obey and stand by his word or stand on his word, I should say. Now, earlier I alluded to a reference of Zechariah chapter three about Joshua, the high priest, an example of, of Jesus Christ, the high priest standing before Satan, the accuser. And, and uh, I just want to read, I just want to read a comment because we, we can't go into it, but Please, our viewers, read uh, Zechariah chapter 3. You'll get the full context and the understanding. But I want to read a con, con, uh, 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 with a, a paragraph, a comment from a, a favorite Christian author. And it reads this in regards to um, uh, Zechariah chapter 3. It says, Christ is our high priest. Satan stands before him night and day as an accuser of the brethren with, with his master masterly power, he presents every objectionable future feature. He presents every objectionable feature of character as sufficient reason for the withdrawal of Christ's protection, of, of Christ's protecting power. So he needs Christ to withdraw that protection so he can have access. And then it goes on to say, thus allowing Satan to discourage and destroy those whom he has caused to sin. The, the, the highlight of that text is that Satan is going before God to accuse you, to accuse me, to accuse James of our sins. And he's mm -hmm. in the right that we belong to him. And he has a right to do with us as he pleases. But praise God, it says that, that Christ is protecting us from Satan's destructive vices, ways, and intentions. And I want to say amen to that. Also, <laughs> if I can say, yes, of course. 
Yeah, that is a good point you just mentioned, shown in Zachariah chapter five, chapter three, verse eight, one to five, and um, and um, normally Satan was not wrong there. No. When Satan said James belonged to me, he's a sinner, he was not wrong. Yeah. But Jesus Christ said James don't like your way. Hey, he love my way. Nothing amen. you can do about this. Get out of here. And he called an angel, said, take the, the filthy rug away from him yeah, and give yeah. him a righteous robe. That's the Amen. difference. If Amen. we don't have this advocate, we cannot sit stand in front of Satan, say to Satan, no, I'm not a sinner. We can't do that. You yes. know, we need Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ, no, uh, we need him. Amen. Amen. Yes. Let, me, let me read another and, and one older uh, commentary. Uh, states, and this is a, uh, written by uh, Richard Barrett. Uh, it says, a synopsis of criticism upon those passages of the Old Testament in which modern commentators have differed. Volume one, uh, page 254. And it says, in regards to Exodus 12, verse 23, it says, here are manifestly two distinct agents with which the notion of passing over is not consistent for that supposes, but one agent, the two agents are the destroying angel passing through to smite every house and Jehovah, the protector keeping pace with him and who seeing the door of the Israelite marked with the blood, the token prescribed leaps forward, throws himself with a sudden motion in the way, opposes the destroying angel and covers and protects that house against the destroying angel, nor suffers him to smite it. Mm. Another powerful comment and evidence to how God smites. So this is going to be it. Let's wrap it up. Let's wrap this one up. It is evident that the destroyer in Exodus 12, 23 is not God, but another uh, entity or another power, another person. The psalmist would later tell us, as I already referenced earlier, the psalmist tells us that it was evil angels. As we read in Psalm 78, uh, verse 49 and 51. It was evil angels that destroyed uh, the firstborn in Egypt. Mm -hmm. Read it for yourself. Then I want to say that um, another translation of Psalms 78 is uh, a book written, uh, a Bible, a Jewish Bible written by Isaac Lesser. And it says of Psalm 78, verse 49 and 51, it says, he lit loose against them the fierceness of his anger, wrath, and indignation, and distress, a host of angels of misfortune. He leveled a path for his anger. He withheld not from their he withheld not from death their soul and their life. He surrendered to the pestilence, and he smote all the firstborn in Egypt the first of their strength in the tents of Ham. Again, that translation says that he withheld not from death their soul and he surrendered them to the pestilence. Again, God is not an active agent in the destruction of the firstborn in Jerusalem. So through today's topic, how does God smite? I hope that the ideal of permission rather than causation is seen on how God smites. And particularly in this uh, Psalm 78 verse 50, where it says, where we can read, but gave their life over to the pestilence. God smote the firstborn of Egypt by letting loose the demonic forces that they themselves worshiped and gave their lives over to the destruction that these forces bring. <laughs> Or we can also compare or read uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5, where Paul says, read the whole thing, though. I'm just giving this one scripture. Read the whole thing. It says, 
uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 5 reads, To deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of their flesh. Again, who's destroying us? Not God. Rather, I conclude with, God was holding back evil forces poised to attack and inflict, and inflict Egypt's uh, 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 to inflict. But Egypt's, Egypt's stubbornness and rejection of God left him with no choice but to let satanic forces loose upon them. I can imagine in my imagination from Zechariah chapter three, Satan and his evil angels saying, look, they don't even want you. They've rejected you. They want to serve me and they're mine. And I have a right to do with them whatever I please. And I can see God tearfully weeping and crying as he says and agrees with Satan and says, I must let them go. I must deliver them up. I must give them up to you, the one that they chose. My children have chose you rather than me. However, we got to remember that God personally stood guard over the homes of the Israelites who obeyed his word and covered their homes with the blood of the lamb. Remember, everyone is saved by grace through faith, by faith, by trusting God. They trusted God and covered their doorposts with the blood of the lamb, accepting the salvation provided for them in the future at that time by Jesus Christ. Therefore, God on, God's only relation to killing the firstborn in Egypt is by permission and not by causation. Mm. As James referenced before, if you want to know about the destroyer, Jesus clearly identifies him in John 10.10. 10, and then also John the Revelator identifies him in Revelation chapter 9. You can look at verses 1 and then 11, but obviously read it for the context. Read it through thoroughly and get the context of it. So any closing comments, James? And then I'll have a... Um, yes, the uh, only thing I would, I would like to share with everybody, because um, God not give people up just like this. No. And sometimes if you insist and the devil insists and God give you up, and if you repent, the same like Israel people, if you repent, you want to come back, God always... Just uh, why like, like, like Jonah, prevent? like Jonah and the Ninevites, like Jonah in the Ninevites, many places. Uh, you know, you know that the worst king, Manasseh, in the Bible, and when he called God and God arm open and bring him back to Jerusalem, you know, God is a loving God. But if you want to go again, he let you go. But it's very sad, you know. But he he he, he, he want everybody to have eternal life, not to die, uh, die forever. Yes, I love that. Yes. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you for highlighting that because that is another gold nugget, James, that God does not let his children go easily. Mm. I mean, just think about it. It's been 2,000 years approximately since mm. the cross of Calvary, and God has not come yet. And that is because of 2 Peter chapter uh, 3, verse 9. God is not slack concerning his promise, but desires that everyone would repent of their sins and have eternal life. Amen. God wants us to have eternal life. Amen. And it is up to us whether or not we trust God, mm. that we love God. Amen. God has been misrepresented. But mm. for us, we he, he, for our sake, he gave the true representation in his son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Jesus Christ is the express image, the exact likeness, God's person in the flesh. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 1 through 3. And obviously I, I've quoted John chapter uh, John chapter one, and then you can read even in Hebrews 10 chapter, uh, Hebrews 10 verses five through seven about Jesus uh, came into this body that was prepared for him for us to see who God is. Mm. Open our eyes, open our hearts. I beg you, God doesn't want to destroy, doesn't want the destroyer to destroy anyone. Please consider this study. And go through it for yourself. Mm. And with that passionate plea, we've come to a conclusion. And it is in great gratitude that we thank you for joining us. We hope that we have challenged your understanding of the character of God in directness or more direct 
in how God smites. <clears throat> and it is our prayer that you will study these Bible verses and references and that, that we have shared and that the Holy Spirit will convict your heart about the true character of God and that you may know the only true God, mm. Jesus Christ, whom he sent. Amen. That is our prayer. Please join us next week when James will be discussing uh, uh, topic uh, number, number eight, which is how does God destroy? Mm. Another good topic mm. that I think has been misunderstood. Let yes. us bow our heads as we close in prayer. Mm. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the assurity that when we let the Bible be its own commentary, when we let the Bible be its own dictionary, that we get clarity on who you are mm -hmm. and how words have been misapplied, misunderstood, mistranslated, that reflect negatively on your character of love. Mm -hmm. Lord, continue to open our eyes open our hearts that we may receive you in and continue to strengthen our faith. Lord, you know the word that was mentioned in the New Testament. Lord, uh, I believe, but help thou my unbelief. Strengthen mm -hmm. our faith and trust in you, dear Lord, so that we can stand strong like Job did in the adversity that is upon us now and the great adversity that is approaching us as we get closer to your soon coming. And the enemy, the accuser, Satan, the serpent of old, come, who has come down with great wrath, mm -hmm. pushes that wrath upon us more, or the consequences of that wrath upon us more. But Lord, may we take shelter in the blood of the lamb, and may we trust you with our lives, even when our lives are at risk. Continue to bless me and James as we continue to share about mm -hmm. your love, your character, and how you want and desire to run your government. Mm -hmm. And how we continue to expose the misrepresentations of your character. And we use the Bible to show your love for us, your children. Mm -hmm. As our viewers who hear and listen and view this, may they be blessed. And Lord, as we dismiss now, and go our ways. May you keep us until we can meet again. According to your great mercies and grace. In the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Amen.